Stan Gibalisco here again, ham radio station and operator W1GV, Whiskey One Golf Victor. A little more discussion about another form of ionospheric propagation. Now, I did a video earlier about ham radio in the ionosphere. and the most familiar type of ionospheric radio wave propagation occurs as short wave radio signals are returned to the earth by ionized layers in the upper atmosphere primarily the F1 and F2 layers the uppermost layers occasionally the E layer the D layer serves only to get in the way particularly during daylight hours on uh, particularly the lower part of the shortwave band below about 10 megahertz or so. Well that's the most familiar type of ionospheric propagation and I just talked a little while about a little while ago about meteor scatter propagation as meteors pass through these ionized layers these sensitive upper atmospheric layers they seem to be pretty temperamental and sensitive to a lot of effects. Uh, given the slightest provocation, they will, the atoms will lose their electrons and become electrically charged, and that's how this all happens. That's why we get this returning the radio signals to Earth effect, because these ionized regions of charged atoms tend to do that to radio waves at certain frequencies. So we have conventional ionospheric propagation. Sometimes this is called sky wave propagation. And if you are a citizens band radio operator or have been around them, they will occasionally refer to this phenomenon as skip, although that's technically not quite right. Anyway, these temperamental layers are subject to another effect, and that is if the sun has a temper tantrum. Now, we've heard a lot uh, lately about uh, a phenomenon called electromagnetic pulse. That is something that happens when the sun has a temper tantrum. We get an electromagnetic pulse in our atmosphere and it can cause various disruptions if it's powerful enough it can interfere with the operation of the utility grid it it causes the ionosphere to completely shut down so that sky wave propagation or <laughs> skip as you might want to call it suddenly stops working but there's another phenomenon that takes place and usually these are associated with events called solar flares. Our um, news media these days, well, first of all, we have a much more vulnerable infrastructure to these kinds of effects today than we did even 20 or 30 years ago. And back in the days of, oh, the good old early years of the 20th century, uh, maybe they didn't seem so good at the time, but sometimes in retrospect they do. Our infrastructure was a lot more hardened to these effects. But now, every time there's a solar flare, you see headlines in the paper. Oh my gosh! You know we're gonna have a we're gonna have a meltdown of our entire utility grid, and we're going to end up out in the wilderness somewhere with with you know you know you've seen those survivalists and everything. We have a huge event. Well, I suppose it's possible. And I was just talking with someone today um, in the sauna at the Deadwood Rec Center as I warmed up after getting all cold in that pool of theirs, that wonderful pool of theirs. And we were talking about this kind of event, solar flares. How much of a threat do they really pose? Well, I don't know and I'm not sure that anyone really does, but we can get an idea if we go all the way back to the year 1859 when there was a solar eruption 
that was sufficient to cause an electromagnetic pulse so strong that it got into the telegraph wires. You know, we didn't have a utility grid back in 1859 of the type that we do today. But we did have telegraph stations and wires going across the country, the United States. And these electromagnetic waves, these pulses from this event were sufficiently powerful to set up a surge current, surge current, in these telegraph wires that actually started some telegraph stations on fire. It was almost as if the, the lines had been struck by lightning. As a matter of fact, we had a power failure here right in my neighborhood a couple weeks ago. We had a near lightning strike, and the electromagnetic pulse tripped one of the transformers, apparently, right in my neighborhood, and for about two hours we were without electricity. Good old Black Hills Power, though, they got right on it and fixed it. Maybe because I called them about a half a dozen times. I was one of the people who had, who had a phone that still worked. You know, um, you don't want to use a landline phone during a thunderstorm, but if you have an uninterruptible power supply and backup power generator for your cordless phones, you can keep right on using those, and that's exactly what I did. But anyway, that's the electromagnetic pulse. Well, when you have a, an electromagnetic pulse in association with the solar flares in particular, you get these charged particles from the sun. Mainly, uh, elect or, uh, pardon me, protons, uh, uh, charged particles from the sun arrive at the Earth a few minutes up to a few hours after one of these solar flares and they disrupt this temperamental ionosphere and you get aurora aurora now uh, the most common form that you that you probably have seen the aurora borealis or northern lights particularly if you live at a higher latitude 40 degrees north latitude and further north than that. I grew up in Minnesota, so we saw this on a fairly regular basis. We also had good dark skies. We didn't have real lot of city lights back in that day. There's another one, uh, another aurora that occurs in the southern hemisphere called the Aurora Australis, Australis never knew exactly how to pronounce that, but it means southern lights. They occur in regions near the Earth's magnetic poles. The Earth's magnetic poles is where these charged particles tend to get focused. And when that happens, what you get is an effect that you can actually see from space. And there's what it looks like right there. I think I'll delete that so that you can see this a little bit better. There's Australia. These are the southern lights. That's Australia. That presumably is Antarctica. Right at the center here is presumably where the southern magnetic pole is, the Earth's south uh, magnetic pole or geomagnetic pole. And as these charged particles from the sun approach the earth they come around the earth as if the earth was a big bar magnet and these charged particles were iron filings have you ever seen that experiment where the iron filings tend to focus in on the magnetic poles of the magnet well same thing with the earth which is just one huge magnet and as these particles get accelerated and they pass through that temperamental upper atmosphere they produce these clouds of ionization that uh, produce uh, radio interference at all wavelengths, even into the visible light spectrum, electromagnetic interference. Well, radio hams can bounce their signals off of these things, off of these ionized regions here. Suppose that you have, for example, a radio ham in Perth, Australia. It'd be right about over here. And another one in, say, Brisbane right up about here well 
perhaps from Brisbane you might be able to see this aurora and from Perth you might be able to see it. You certainly would from a more southerly location like Adelaide, Australia. And maybe New Zealand over here. You can't really see New Zealand. It's somewhere over here. You get down in the southern part of New Zealand. They can Radio hams can communicate by bouncing their signals off of these aurora, but there's some phenomena that occur with this. These are unstable, these aurora. If you've seen them, you can actually watch them move. And these fluctuating ionized clouds like this will reflect radio waves, but they tend to be a moving target, uh, something like meteor scatter or meteor trails, except they move uh, more rapidly. And you, what you end up getting is a phase modulated signal even if it's just a continuous constant frequency say morse code signal it's going to get phase modulated by this uh, movement of these clouds and so what's going to spread it's phase modulation remember is something like frequency modulation if you have one you always have the other so what you're going to get is a Morse code signal that fluctuates in frequency a little bit, sometimes so rapidly that it doesn't even sound like a tone when you listen to it. It sounds more like a, oh my, it sounds kind of like a, like a, <laughs> almost like something frying in the, on the stove or, or somebody gurgling underwater. Have you ever screamed at, at your partner under the water and listened to the noise? bubbles passing out you know well it's kind of a weird analogy but it it tends to sound kind of uh kind of weird but if you send slowly enough morse code can be an effective way to communicate by auroral propagation we might actually call this auroral propagation of course, it's not the aurora that propagate, it's the radio waves that propagate. But that's how it works, and that's uh, sort of what the effect is that produces it. It tends to occur at many of the same frequencies that meteor scatter does. The upper part of the HF spectrum, 21, 28 megahertz, 50 megahertz, uh, and occasionally up into the higher ranges, 144 megahertz. You kind of have to listen around, but if you hear a signal that sounds really, really warbly and distorted, a Morse code signal, like it's being phase modulated, especially if you hear it on, say, 28 megahertz at night, you can have a pretty good assurance that what you're hearing is auroral propagation. With that, Stan Jibalisco... W1GV will sign off. My website is sciencewriter.net. You can find links to all of my work and interests at this website. And you can sometimes find W1GV operating CW and PSK31 mainly on the 20 meter or 14 megahertz band, but also occasionally on 18, 21, and 24 megahertz. 73 from the Black Hills of Dakota Territory, United States of America, near good old Deadwood. So long.